to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hello there from Bedford. How are you all? You well? I'm back home, back to the most vibrant city for Bitcoin in the world. And I had an amazing time on holiday, had such a great time out in Cambodia and Vietnam. It was nice to down tools a little, have a bit of a break, but I'm now back focusing on creating some amazing content for Bitcoiners. So welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken, the best place for traders to buy and sell Bitcoin. And this week, I finally got an interview with my buddy and fellow podcaster, Stefan Levera, to discuss Austrian economics, libertarianism and Bitcoin. But before that, let's check out my amazing show sponsors. And don't skip this. If you enjoy the show, if you're a regular listener, make sure you do check out the sponsors because it's those amazing companies which make this happen for me. So firstly, today's show is brought to you by Dropbit. And I know so many of you have downloaded the app. The feedback is always great. And I don't think there has been a single person yet who's told me they don't like it. So that speaks volumes for it. Every time you tag me and drop it on Twitter to let me know you've downloaded and what you think, that's amazing. The feedback is always useful. But have you all downloaded it yet? You can't all have. So come on, why not? Why haven't you checked it out? You're missing out on an amazing app. These guys absolutely crush innovation with Bitcoin mobile wallets. You can text Bitcoin. You can tweet Bitcoin. It is like a Venmo for Bitcoin, the easiest way to send and receive. And they are working on some amazing new things. I said before, I tried to get onto a call with them. They were like, leave us alone, Pete. We've got some badass stuff we're working on. Let us focus on that. Go away. So yes, there's some updates coming soon and I know what they are and they are very, very cool. So make sure you join me in supporting Dropbit. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T.app. That's dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T.app. And also today's show is brought to you by Cointing, the best crypto tax calculator and portfolio manager in the market. And their sponsorship is going to be coming to a close soon. So please do make sure you go and check it out as they have been supporting the show for the last few months. You know what one of my favorite things about Cointing is, is their portfolio management, which is a step up from every other portfolio manager I've ever used. And with tax season over, keeping track of your transactions is always going to be important for accounting purposes. This is why you need a Cointing. It is the most complete portfolio tracker in the market offering you both a desktop and app versions so you can manage your portfolio at home or manage it in the queue at Starbucks while you're waiting for your cappuccino and you'll have everything you need ready for next tax season. The tool was created by crypto traders with crypto traders for crypto traders, knowing what is relevant for both the amateur as well as the professional in mind. And they've got a huge update coming. So make sure you download the app and make sure you check out the website it's available for iPhone and Android. Just search for Accointing or head to Accointing.com, which is A-C-C-O-I-N-T-I-N-G.com. Okay, so on to the show. And today is a heavyweight podcaster to podcast a showdown. I've got my buddy, Stefan Levera on, someone I've got to know very well over the last year. We talk quite a lot. He's been very supportive to me in the background. I'm always picking his brain. And if you don't know the Stefan Levera podcast, what are you doing are you living under a rock? You must be. Definitely need to check it out. It's a very different podcast to mine in some ways. Stefan gets into a lot more detail on the technical side of things, but also he is an expert in Austrian economics and libertarianism, and that's where I go to learn more about this. I go to learn from Stefan and also to learn about the crossover with Bitcoin. He has a strong background in Austrian economics and libertarianism. He understands the principles. He understands how they relate to Bitcoin and it was something I was completely unaware of. I, you know, I studied economics at school. I did A-level economics and never once did we ever cover Austrian economics. I wasn't even aware of it. And I've covered this before. I did it with Safe Dean, but I still never 100% got it. And whilst I like the arguments and whilst I agree with a number of the principles when they've been explained to me, I still struggle to understand how it works in reality, like a full free market and operating without state. And in some ways, I do like the minarchist approach, which Francis Poulier talks about. But Stefan does a great job of explaining this all to me, answering my kind of tough questions. And there are a lot of recommendations in the show notes. So if you want to do more reading, definitely check those out. But yes, this was a great show. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, as ever, if you've got any feedback, you can get me on hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Just a couple of notices, some events coming up. I'm going to be at Russell O'Connor's event in LA, and that's on September the 1st. That's called Bitcoin Is. Hope to see some of you there. I'll also be emceeing the Baltic Honey Badger in Riga on September the 14th and 15th. 
I will then be heading out to Wyoming for Caitlin Long's Wire Hackathon. That's the 19th to the 22nd of September. And I'll also be heading to Crypto Springs, which is September the 23rd to the 25th in Palm Springs. Hopefully going to meet a bunch of you at those events. Hit me up if you're going to be there. Just a couple of other things. I'm also going to be setting up my first node. I've kind of had a play before, but never really completed it. I put something out on Twitter, upset a few people, sorry. But yes, I'm going to be taking a look at that. I'm also going to be doing an interview with Brian Lockhart about running a node and how you can use them. And I'm also working on my beginner's guide to Bitcoin. So keep an eye out for that. Anyway, listen, I hope you have an amazing weekend. If you've got any questions, reach out to me. Big love to you all. Take care. See you soon. Peter, how are you, man? I'm all right, man. How Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, good. We finally get to do this. <laughs> Podcast worlds collide. Podcast worlds collide. We've been threatening to do this for, what, like six months? Yeah, things just, you know, that's how it is with podcasting. You try and set something up and things just always move around. That's just, that's how the game goes, hey? Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, I wanted to do it in person with you, but for various reasons I can't because we keep missing each other. Are you going to Riga? Yes, I will be there. All right, maybe we'll do it again then. But the thing is, what I've realized at these events is that you try and schedule them and you can never really get them in anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, especially at the conferences, you tend to have a lot of things all coming for your attention at once, right? Because you might be talking to someone and then, yeah, it's difficult to arrange. So, uh, But, you know, and, I'm looking forward to it. And if you're emceeing. So I'm doing Riga and you're doing Berlin. Yes, that's right. I will be... Alongside Des Dickerson from Lightning yep. Labs, I'm emceeing the Lightning Conference. How are you feeling about it? Oh, it's fantastic. It's a great opportunity. I'm really, mm. really pumped for it and I'm just really excited. It's got a fantastic lineup, so I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I've definitely got to get to that event. I think the lineup's amazing. It's very cool that they're doing a Lightning only event as well. Exactly. I've been saying this thing is going to grow and it's going to really start. Having each of its own, will have each thing will have its own conferences, its own media, its own thing, right? Lightning will be its own thing. Mining is get, is becoming its own thing. You know, they'll just everything will become its own thing. That's the problem I find though, then, because there's so much to learn and so much to get your head around. I think that's one of the things other people don't realize when you're podcasting. You can't really. It's very difficult to just be a niche podcast, right? You've got to you've got to cover economics. You've got to cover mining. You've got to cover trading. You've got to cover tech you've got to cover lightning you've got to, there's so much to cover and i mean you do a better job in terms of understanding a lot of it than i do but trying to just consume all the different knowledge or the articles or the podcasts like i don't know how other people do it i struggle i, I don't know how you find it <laughs> no i'll tell you what it's like you're on a treadmill that's ever increasing in the speed right <laughs> <laughs> so you've just got right? to get fitter yeah well look i think part of it is just people will eventually niche down Right. So the analogy I've heard before is like, imagine you were a computer researcher in the 50s or the 60s. You could probably go to every computer conference and read every computer technical journal. But then what happened is each thing became its own. You know, there was networking, there was hardware, there was software, there was open source. And it just became too much for any one person to be across everything. And that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin as well. It's going to get so big that each, you know, there'll be mining-specific podcasts, there'll be lightning-specific podcasts, you know, there'll be, and not just podcasts, right? It'll be magazines and, uh -huh. you know, journalists and everything. That's how it's going to go. As it takes over the world. Well, you know what? That's funny you should say that as well. I mean, you saw my thread this morning about nodes, right? <laughs> of course, yes. So uh, that's been like my guilty secret for a long time, is that I've never fully set up a node and... I kind of feel like a bit of a fraud because of it, because the way people talk about it, especially someone like Luke, or when I talked about doing my beginner's guide and people are like, well, you've got to include having a node in it. And I was thinking, oh shit, I've never really admitted that I've never set a node up because I'm intimidated by it. So I was like, fuck it, I'll put it out there. I'll see what the response is. And then I'm just watching this debate going on and thinking, hmm, I think I'm kind of validated now. <laughs> yeah, no, look, absolutely. So the way to think about that is you've got to understand, firstly, why is it important to run a node? What is that node doing? And a lot of people, when they're new to Bitcoin, they don't understand this, right? So here's a typical progression, right? So firstly, you might buy Bitcoins and leave them on the exchange. You know, obviously, leaving yourself at risk of getting wrecked, a big no-no, bad practice. Second level is, okay, maybe get a hardware wallet, okay? Now, okay, that's a little bit better because now, as Andreas says, not your keys, not your coins, you're holding your own keys, 
Yeah. So that's the next kind of step. And then the next step typically after that is someone might run a node, but not really understand why it's important. So they might just be running a node thinking they're supporting the network, but they're not actually using it to validate incoming transactions. Right. And then the next level is running your own node, typically something like Electrum personal server, like using it something like that, and then pairing that back against your own, using that to connect with your own hardware wallet or your own setup in such a way that you are now using Bitcoin in the way it was meant to be used. You are using it to verify incoming transactions. And in doing so, you are in some sense defending, quote unquote, the rule set of Bitcoin. So that's kind of the key justification. But a lot of people don't understand that, right? So they just think, oh, uh, I'm just running a node to quote unquote support the network. But actually, correctly understood, it's more like you're using it to verify that you truly hold Bitcoins. Because theoretically, if you got it on, say, a Trezor or a Ledger, Trezor or Ledger, if you're just using their web wallet service, they could theoretically, they could be lying to you. And so that's understanding. And part of this is the journey. And I think that as hardcore Bitcoiners, it's our job to teach people to move up that progression ladder, so to speak. And they, part of it is that journey because at the start, you're just like, what is this? Do I even, why do I even want Bitcoin? And then you start of, you slowly understand a little bit more about what makes Bitcoin so special. And that's why if you talk to the hardcore Bitcoiners, they'll give you basically a similar answer to what I'm just giving you now. You did, though, manage to articulate that in a single tweet earlier. <laughs> True. You did. You got that in 280 characters. It's not an easy, yeah, look, I, not with the same detail, right? Like, someone could look at that tweet and think, why? Why would I do that? Well, that's the funny thing about our podcast as well, because I kind of think it's the same. I think of mine as the beginner's podcast, and I think of yours as more of like the intermediate advanced topics. And even when we've had the same guests, I think you can compare the two shows. You can almost like the one with Rao or the one we both did with Zabi Wallet, right? Ah, yeah. And you can actually hear the shows. You could almost put them back to back and go, right, do Pete's because that's like the beginner dumb questions. And then when you want to get a bit more advanced, you can go after Stefan. So we guess uh, who's going to be the super advanced one? Is that going to be you as well? <laughs> Who knows, right? Maybe that's noted or maybe it's maybe someone else is going to come in and they're going to be like the really super technical podcast, whereas I'm sort of intermediate and like bottom end of advanced kind of. Hey, but you were, you're now full time, man. So how's that going? Yes, I am. I uh, Now I'm definitely finding it very liberating, right? It's my passion, yeah. right? I love, I love doing this stuff. I love the process of, you know, just that constant trying to improve as well. Like I'm constantly trying to improve my technical knowledge, but at the same time trying to get, you know, obviously trying to get good guests on and trying to craft a good discussion in terms of what are some good topics that I'm going to ask them and wh wh what are some areas that I might have to push back or challenge them a little bit versus other areas where I might think, okay, here's a certain... A thing to promote that I want to help promote. So, you know, for example, I did the BTC Pay Server series recently, and now I'm doing a hardware wallet series. So I've got kind of different ideas on what I can do to keep improving and making the content better and better. And at the same time, trying to kind of help the what I think do what I think helps, you know, my, you know, what I think the Bitcoin ecosystem needs. So have you managed to quit a full time job, but completely fill all your time? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's one of those things. What's that saying? It's like a saying, um, the work expands to fit the time given, you know? Yeah. So you give yourself more time, but then you just take on more tasks and then you'll just start doing more episodes, for example, or I might, you know, take on other things and other little projects as well. So, I mean, I've got this Ministry of Notes thing, which is like an education thing as well. You got, is that your to-do list? Yes, to-do list. This is like my get back off holiday to-do list. I've got my urgent and then super urgent, and then, fuck, I really need to get this done stuff. You just, there's so many, like, because you have ideas and things you want to do, you know, you just fill it up with time, you fill up the time with stuff, but uh, no, it's cool to see you going full time on it, man. It's It's been really fun to watch the progression of everyone's show, actually, because there's like a whole bunch of shows. I think some people think, think of us all as competing, and they probably don't even realize that we all chat in the background and support and help each other. But I feel like as a group of people, we are we do kind of all complement each other well, and there isn't too many overlaps. Yeah, well, I think people just naturally find their own little niche and their own little angle, 
you know, and so I think that's a key thing as well. I mean, even for anyone who's thinking about how they want to contribute, it, I think a key thing is find a gap, find something that's not being done well, find something that you could really improve. You know, a, a good example might be now, okay, look, there's a fair bunch of English podcasts. What about podcasts in other languages for Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. That's probably a big gap right now. So yeah. there's a big, big need for that. So, you know, I, that's, that's just an example, right? But I think ultimately you're right. People sort of find their own niche and We've all got our own slightly different styles, right? Like I think you and I are somewhat stylistically similar, but someone, you know, there might be, you know, slight differences in the way that we would interview people or slight differences in the, maybe some people are, some material is more like entertainment and some is more like education. So there's that too. Yeah, I I definitely think I put my side more on the entertainment side. I like finding the fun interviews. The one I did with Jack Mallers and his family, where I got stoned during the interview. I thought that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> that was great. But I'm not an educator. Uh, the people I interview are educators. Like, I couldn't do a solo sh- show like you did. That's still my favorite one of your shows. I absolutely love that show. It's the only one of yours I've listened to twice. I don't tend to listen to any podcast more than once. But you can educate. I can't. I think the only way I can educate is by asking questions that people are probably nervous to ask or just don't know where to ask and again that no tweet is a perfect example because a bunch of people have come forward and said yeah i don't get this <laughs> so I, I think that's probably where i i think i tend to fit in are there any like things that you've learned along the way any things that surprised you in podcasting anything you've found yourself focusing on yeah well for me it's ultimately whenever i've interviewed somebody i've gone and done research on them so then that's made me learn a little bit more about the topic just so that I can have a nicer conversation and obviously make it more fruitful and high signal for my listeners. So that's a big thing that I've done. I think it's forced me to then go and learn certain topics more deeply and understand them at least at a conversational level, even if I'm not an expert. And I mean, again, as you're saying, like there's so much, you, it's just so difficult for any one person to really uh, keep keep running on that treadmill that's ever, ever increasing in the speed. But uh, yeah, I've definitely over my last, well, I've been going for a little over a year now in terms of my podcast. And I would say I've deepened my knowledge of a lot of topics like Bitcoin privacy, Lightning Network, even some of the economics of it as well, I've deepened some of that knowledge as well. I think it's just a constant journey of learning. And for me, I'm in some sense, I'm taking my listeners along with me on that journey of learning. But at the same time, I'm trying to think, think of the beginner as well and try to relay back some info for them where maybe there's a lot of technical jargon and it's difficult for them. I try to relate it back and say, okay, let me just try and summarize that in non-technical terms just for you to be able to follow along. Have you done any cold interviews where you've had no questions or prep in front of you? You've just gone in and done it. Oh, some of them were, I would say, with light preparation, maybe because I knew the person, I kind of already knew what we were going to get into. But I would say most of mine I've done at least there's probably one or two that I've done. So probably my interview with Alex Svetsky, which was a bit lighter in the preparation. And that one was a little bit more of a chilled back discussion about mindsets of Bitcoin, not like let's talk about technical components of Bitcoin or Lightning Network or economics. So some of them, yeah. But I think I've tended to be a bit more premeditated in my approach. Right, I see. So one in five of mine now, about one in five, I do without any prep, any questions. And that was one of the things I wanted to improve as an interviewer, because I don't know if you've ever had this, but I found sometimes with some of my interviews that I got through my questions and maybe I was like 35 minutes in and I was thinking, crap, I need an hour. And then just trying to stretch it out, it kind of threw me. So what I when I interviewed Pomp, we talked about this. He doesn't do any prep, almost no prep for any interview. And also what I've done is I've started listening to other people's podcasts to try and learn from it, non-crypto ones. So I've listened to a lot of Rogan, I've listened to Sam Harris. So I set myself a challenge. I think it was Mark Weinstein I did it the first time, the guy from the Fire Festival. But now I'm trying to do like about one in five without any questions in front of me just to try and develop that conversational flow, right? So when I do have one of these ones where I run out of questions, I, I know how to carry it on. It's, uh, it's definitely a challenge worth trying. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there have definitely been times for me, personally, I can share, there have been times where I've gotten through the questions really quickly as well. And then I've been thinking, okay, but I, I, typically, I think part of what we do is we're just naturally curious, right? And that's what makes oh, yeah. us podcasters, right? So we tend to just be able to come up with stuff and 
prod a little bit and think about, okay, well, what about if you did it in this way? And you can sort of try to put yourself into that mindset of thinking, okay, this would be an interesting question to ask. I think a lot of listeners would want to know about X, Y, and Z. Let's, yeah. you know, let's hear that. You know? So that's, I think, yeah, that's definitely a learning for me as well. Have you gone back and listened to your first show again? Oh, no, I have not in a long time. But uh, I'll tell you what, like, there are some times where I have gone back and listened to it, like some older episodes, because I was, you know, doing some editing and stuff. And it's like, whoa, my audio was terrible. Yeah, I, I really feel sorry. I don't know how some of my listeners like put up with that back in the early days. But I mean, they did. I guess back then, there just wasn't as much stuff out there. And so they were just happy to have anything, right? And hey, man, so, you, you, yeah. you got no excuse now. You're like a pro, you're full time, you gotta have you gotta have all the gear. You gotta have the pro sound. You gotta have the pro website. You can't. You've got no excuse now, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, yeah. Look, I've I've obviously very quickly progressed up in terms of audio quality, production value, that sort of thing. So, yeah. I mean, and recently I did a bit of a rebranding as well. So I'm happy with that. It looks so good that rebrand work. Yeah. Thank you. I got it by from uh, Tai Kawamoto. So definitely um, hit him up. Have you met him? Yeah, yeah, at uh, Bitcoin 2019 in San Francisco. Oh, yeah, Francisco. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, he's such a cool guy. I really like that guy. But it's also one of those funny things is like, I think a lot of people underestimate what goes into doing a podcast, right? They see someone doing a podcast, they think, oh, I'm going to give it a go. But they don't realize that not only are you a researcher and interviewer, you're also a marketeer, you're a salesperson, you might have to be a coder. Like there's so many different things you have to do in the background. You know, when I was doing it all, I think for every hour of interview, there was 10 hours of work, no, maybe 20 hours of work in the background. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's definitely something is very underappreciated, right? Because from the outside looking in, you just think, oh, just get him on a call or meet him in person, just press record and off you go, right? Isn't that, isn't that we... all you have to do, Peter? <laughs> that's just done, yeah. We're, and we're live, yeah. Now, now we're rich. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, for me, when I started, and I mean, even now, it's... I. When I was working a full-time job before, it was basically, I, it took up all my spare time. I had yep. no spare time. I was just spending all my time doing research, all my time trying to hustle and get guests on, just all my time trying to, and then doing audio production and then putting it on a website and trying to make it all work. And now, yes, there are certain tools that help you make it a little bit more efficient, but it's kind of like that treadmill idea again. The more you sort of start doing the work expense to fit the time given and then you start yep. thinking, oh, I'll do more episodes or I'll do more of this and I'll do more of that. And then very quickly, your time is gone. And so I think another thing that's maybe underappreciated is being skilled and knowledgeable about Bitcoin is not the same skill as making content. Right. Nope. So it's like, it's just people don't, I think a lot of people don't understand that. So they just think, oh, like you have a lot of following or whatever, and you should be like super knowledgeable about Bitcoin. But the reality is you're spending a lot of your time doing audio production or like all these other tasks that are, you know, required. And so you don't have as much time to actually deeply understand some of these things now obviously there's still no excuse right you've got it from my point of view i'm just i do what i can to try and learn it's a constant learning journey but yeah there are definitely times where i would have liked to been able to try that person's product or service out a little bit more before i interviewed them so that way i kind of i can speak to it and i'm more conversant to it but in reality i only got a chance to do it a little bit of trying that because I was busy researching some other, some something else or doing some other organization work. So that's kind of how it's played for me. But I think that's also useful for listeners. Like, you know, I obviously have a group of people who aren't particularly fond of my podcast because they think I'm a, you know, technically illiterate and a bit of a moron. But actually, there's so many people I think are in my shoes. So by by having that experience, I'm kind of living it in parallel to them. So actually, I think that's useful to people. Uh, I think you can get some people out there hugely knowledgeable in terms of Bitcoin. They might not necessarily make a great podcast. So I just think it's, uh, I don't know, we tend to find what we're good at. I think some coders will code, some people will make a podcast. I think as long as everyone's contributing to the pie and not being too much of a, you know, an ass about things, I think we can all help each other. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think people just find their own niche, right? I think people just naturally sort of see, oh, okay, this person's already doing that. I can either help them with it or I can work on something else, right? And mm -hmm. it's it's sort of people just naturally divide themselves in some ways. All right, well, listen, we can talk about podcasting for ages. It might be boring for everyone, but we really should talk about Austrian economics because that's the thing 
I've been threatening to do a show with you about for quite some time. So I did a little bit of like Austrian economics, libertarianism with safety recently, but I kind of want to go into with you. You don't need to do your background. People will know your background. They'll know that you've got a, like a, a strong background in Austrian economics. I'll definitely forward them to your show that you did about it because they, they should have a listen. But I still don't fully get it. And also, I've been kind of throwing some questions out on Twitter, going down the rabbit hole a bit, trying to understand you know, where the crossover between Austrian economics is with people who, who are uh, anti-state, who want a complete kind of anarchy, the people who are all about self-sovereignty and guns. There's lots of things that kind of align, but then also contradict. So I'm going to do a bunch of interviews like this and speak to different people to get their perspectives. But Let's go into detail with you because some people might not have heard your show. I almost want to do uh, explain Austrian economics like I'm five. Let's go really super simple. What it is, let's start with what it is, the background and like why people should care about it. The reason I think that's an important part is I actually studied economics at school. So we have uh, GCSEs and A-levels. I did economics at A-level. I did macro and micro. Part of that, we studied Keynesian theory. At not one point in my life had I heard of Austrian economics until bitcoin right <laughs> so yeah, and that's a shame yeah, it, yeah. It, is, it is a shame and you know there's probably different reasons for why it isn't taught but let's start with what is the background to it why do you care about it and why should other people care yeah sure great a great question so i think the fundamental difference between the austrian school one key difference to think about is it's fundamentally about this idea of spontaneous organization and it's fundamentally about this idea if you think of it like the ability of things to organize in a bottom-up way. So imagine that we are organizing in a bottom-up organizational way rather than this kind of top-down government or king method, right? And so rather than taking that view, we take that, think of it like a bottom-up view. And we think of it like we focus on the role of the individual and the choices made by an individual. And so that's probably at a very, if I was you know, trying to explain it without any technical terms, that's that's probably what I would say. Now, if you want to dive the next level down, it's we would say it's a particular economic approach that is using deductive reasoning in some sense. And that is why we reason in a different way using Austrian economics as opposed to other schools of economics. And that's something that's very characteristic uh, or very quintessential or that's what identifies the Austrian school is a certain way uh, it's known as the praxeological method of argumentation of reasoning so the idea is you you might start with a certain premise such as humans act purposefully and we try to achieve certain ends using scarce means right there's scarce resources and so from that the idea is that you would then deduce certain other truths and that's kind of the very fundamental building block, one of the fundamental building blocks of Austrian economics. And then another very key related idea, and it, this is if you read the book Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, which is a great first read in terms of Austrian economics. And so in that book, Henry Hazlitt basically talks to you about this lesson of the seen and the unseen. And so the idea is, if you would have, you probably would have learned in your economic classes this concept of ceteris paribus, right? Keeping all other things equal, right? And so that's a quick example of how an Austrian would conceive of things to try and understand, okay, let's say there was a broken window in the town and somebody said, oh, but that might stimulate more demand for the you know, glass guy who's going to come and fix that, right? But then an Austrian might step back and say, well, hold on. Remember that if that window was not broken, then whoever that shop owner was could have spent that money on something else. So the real loss might have been, say he was a baker, he could have made, he might have been able to buy some other kind of baking machinery. And that's the real loss. So that's a key lesson. That's known as the parable of the broken window. So that's like a very introductory kind of lesson that a lot of Austrians would bring. And so there's a few things around that, but essentially... What most of this boils down to, or what it results in, in some, in some cases, is a, is a very free market approach to things. The idea is that we should have a society with voluntary interactions and with the in a system with strong private property rights, then that is what enables a better consideration of the costs and the benefits of things. And in doing so, we would have a more economically stable and prosperous society. Now, I, I just, I, might, I guess I might just anticipate a quick question here. Part of it is, 
we have to distinguish between the economics part of it and the political philosophy part of it, right? Mm-hmm. So the economics part is value free. It is a science, right? It is a if you want society be this, you know, more productive, etc. You know, this kind of, you know, this is what would do better, right? But then the political philosophy part of it, on the other hand, is more like what is the moral component of that? Is that that is value laden? Are we passing? Are we saying it would be good to have a rich society, and you know, therefore, you know, we should you know have a society that is more libertarian or more respectful of individual rights and prop- private property rights? So, I guess I would just call out to the listeners there that that is the difference there. So, economics itself is value free. It's not passing a moral judgment, but the political philosophy part of libertarianism that is value laden. Okay. All right, a lot to Does get into. Does that make sense? Here. Yes and no. I mean, it's a lot to get into, and I've got different areas. I, I, you know, I'm keeping notes as we do this. And your hero, Tom Woods, I'm a regular listener to his show as well, oh. and I'm learning a lot about free markets and a lot of anti-socialist kind of rhetoric from him, which is, and rhetoric's the wrong word, just kind of like uh, anti-socialist views. I find it very useful. It's a great show. I don't listen to all of them. But every now and again, it's usually the ones where they focus on socialism because probably because as a kid, you usually have some kind of like heart and you want the best for everyone. I felt like I was probably a socialist. And as I've got older, I've kind of felt like I'm probably more conservative, but I do feel like, God, I I want some fairness for other people. I want to help other people. But being around Bitcoin, I've been around Bitcoiners and you know, libertarians and various other people, I've started to realize there are a lot of problems with socialism. You know, I've just been to Cambodia and I've read a book about the Khmer Rouge and the Marxist state they tried to implement and how terrible that was. Now, I, I don't believe every socialist wants a state similar to that. But what I'm saying is I'm kind of, I'm learning all these things. But there are a few areas I want to dive into first. But the first question I have for you is, can you kind of follow Austrian economic principles in your daily life within the current political and current political climate and the current structures that we have from the governments we already have like is it something that you do and you follow with your own principles or are you restricted by the state and the legislation that currently exists yeah so i would say it's not quite something that you can in that sense implement in your own life right now there are certain insights that you can draw right so i remember actually from your recent interview with safety and he mentioned a really good point which is that oftentimes the best trades you make are with your future self and that you can you know make certain decisions that will might be short-term pain for a long-term gain, let's say, right? Maybe I don't want to study hard or I don't want to spend all the time to learn this new skill, but it'll pay dividends down in the future, right? Something like that. Okay, fair enough. That's that's definitely something. But I would say for the most part, Austrian economics is, it's like a prism through which you can view the world. It's almost like you can sort of x-ray certain things and see the true purpose, not, not to that level, obviously, but it, it allows you to somewhat perceive a little bit more correctly what's going on and i think to that extent it may help you in certain decisions that you may make in terms of investment or things like that now there are certain people who try to invest based on that cycle and so on that's a little bit more uh, that's sort of starting to step outside the specific austrian economics and they're sort of stepping into a role as like a timeologist sort of thing but yeah like i would say it's mostly more like an analysis of the system or the society that you are in and helping you to perceive more what is the true economic impact of certain decisions that are made so you can critique the current system and identify flaws in it yes yes so we would say okay you know a tariff might be bad because it impedes a voluntarily beneficial trade and so in that sense the consumers are worse off because they would have done this trade, but now they are restricted from doing so. And this is something that can be sort of praxeologically said as well. So we can sort of say we have, you know, if you and I would have done a trade, but then the government says, no, Stefan and Peter, you may not do this trade. Well, then we are worse off because of that. Right. Okay. So a good example might be, I was listening to Joe Rogan's interview yesterday with uh, Bernie Sanders, right? And when you listen to Bernie and the way he explains things, you're like, that makes sense. Why wouldn't you want that? So for a good example for me was when he was talking about minimum wage or a living wage, which we have in our country, in a lot of countries. I don't know if you have it in Australia. Now, it kind of makes sense to anyone when you're thinking with your heart, of course you want people to have a minimum wage and a living wage. Of course you want them to have that. Of course you want people to be able to survive. But there are a lot of flaws with minimum wages, right? 
Oh, absolutely. So this is one of the most like hotly kind of debated, but it's one of the most, I think amongst most economists, they really do appreciate this idea, which is that, you know, demand curves slope downwards and that the more you raise that minimum wage, the more that you are disemploying or making sure that there'll be less people employed at this certain level. Now, it depends what level you want to talk at. At the basic level, yeah, like we would say, yes, like the first kind of order impact is yeah, less people are getting employed at this wage because they're being denied from that trade, right? My hour of labor for your time or for your money, rather. But then you can also see other impacts as well that it might be things like, okay, the employer can't just, is not just making money out of nowhere, right? So he has to make ends meet somehow. And he might pay you less but he might give you less training or he might be more of a stickler and say oh i didn't i saw you took a long lunch you know like things like that to try and make sure he's getting enough value because if he's not getting enough value out of the work you're doing he might not he obviously can't sustainably afford to keep you employed so that's i mean that's a quick high level way to think through that issue uh and there are many other kind of insights that can be drawn from that as well like if you go and read the textbooks and so on so really, there shouldn't be any form of minimum wage. The market should decide the wage for each job independently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's absolutely the Austrian economist would be anti-minimum wage laws and they would suggest that they are you know, negative for society and not just for the immediate here and now impact. It's because a lot of, and this is a little more in the libertarian political philosophy realm, but it's in some sense... It's like you're kicking away the first few rungs of the ladder because oftentimes people need to start somewhere. And also, if you look at the statistics on this sort of thing, it's like there's not that many people who are literally earning the minimum wage. Typically, it's people who are, or if they are, they're not breadwinners, right? They might be a kid living at home with their family. And it's for them, it's a, it's a stepping stone on the way up that ladder to build a skill. And it also, I think, in a more of a social sense, it demeans you. Work is dignifying in some ways because you, you it's it's how people socialize it and it's how people learn new skills. Whereas those of us who are more skeptical of the government and government welfare programs and minimum wage laws and so on would say, well, is that really having a positive impact or maybe it's actually causing a bad downwards spiral for people? And in fact, it would be better to have no minimum wage and in doing so, everyone could get a job and then they could start with start their way working up that ladder okay so i guess the same is true for the reverse there shouldn't really be salary caps either yeah absolutely not no right so yeah i think it would be a similar kind of idea but in this case it would be sort of trying to trace out the impact of that it might just impact the way people work or they might be more inclined to now go and start their own business instead of staying at a certain business yeah it i mean it kind of varies how they impacted that sort of how they put that into place and it might cause a shortage in the number of people because there might be people who let's say they're like they're a superstar they should be getting paid half a million dollars a year but there's a salary cap of four hundred thousand per year well then companies might not be able to find the right talent or they might not be able to get the right talent to draw them in to work in that industry they might go work somewhere else because hey they're worth a half million or whatever well yeah so there's two examples i can think of that the first one is i've heard of salary cuts with regards to sports you know sports teams and such because they want to make it fairer they want to make it fairer for other teams to compete but at the same time if you've got a salary cap you can't perhaps sign somebody you want. Therefore, you're preventing, I guess, a trade, an actual trade, a trade of a player. And mm. the other time I've heard it is also with regards to CEOs. There's kind of complaints in the UK. I think a report came out recently that the CEOs are earning 117 times more than the uh, average employer wage. But I was thinking, well, look, if you had a some form of a business salary cap for, say, a CEO, and that was specifically if that was, say, somewhere in the UK, well, then you might not be able to get the CEO you want because of the cap. Therefore, he might go and work in another country. And actually, then you are also preventing you're preventing another trade of some sort there. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I would say, firstly, though, just with the soccer or sports example, that might be a little bit different because it's more like those leagues are themselves a private organization and everyone's opted into that league. And so mm-hmm. the league might have put in a rule because they want a certain level of 
fair play, so to speak, right? They want they want it to be. They don't want it to have like these super wealthy teams who are just absolutely caning everyone else. They want to sort of make it a little bit more of a even match, so they get more spectators coming to the game. So I could sort of see that, right? That's more of a private rules scenario, right? And I think that's the other thing as well. Like that's a common confusion with outsiders who are looking at libertarians or free market economists they're thinking oh you guys don't want any organization and it's like it's not quiet it's more like we want private organization we want in some sense market regulation as opposed to government regulation that's one way to put it Um, but absolutely the example with the ceos that is a an example where we would say, no, nah, that's actually counterproductive. But that said, it's difficult being a libertarian because then you kind of have to often say, well, hang on, we like this part of the free market. or we, I mean, we'd like the free market in general, but there are certain impacts that are being done right now that are not a result of the free market, right? And so... And in order to understand that, you have to kind of understand, okay, why why is inflation bad? What is the Cantillon effect? What are some of these other more complicated ideas? What about trade unions? What do Australian economics, uh, economists think about trade unions? Ooh, um, not as sure on this one. I think right. most, I, I think it's kind of like, so long as it's a voluntarily entered into agreement, as in, are you referring to here like like the union for employees kind of thing? Yeah, like a teacher's union or a pilot's union. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. So most Austrians on this point would say voluntarily, it's totally fine. But here's the catch. In reality, many trade unions have some form of government coercion or power that is not really a true free market. So, for example, depending on the country you're in, obviously, there may be a law saying the trade union may force the employer to the bargaining table. That's an example where they're given that kind of power by the state. And so... A free market libertarian would look at that and say, well, hold on, that's not quite right. And the other point the Austrian economist would probably make on this point is that, look, there's only so much that can be paid to these employees in a sustainable way. So it's kind of, it's like sometimes what these trade unions do is they end up winning more pay for their members at the cost of non-members, right? And that's a quick right. example. Another one might be like even um, you look at the kind of guilds or professional associations. Some of those function to restrict the supply of new co- new incoming competition, right? So they restrict the supply of new doctors coming in so they keep the existing doctor's salary very high or lawyers or, you know, pick whatever other profession. So that's an example. So for example, if you had a pilot's union at say, I don't know, say British Airways had a pilot's trade union, and they go on strike and force some kind of pay rise for the pilots, that might be at the cost of, say, cabin crew getting a pay rise. Oh, well, yeah, potentially, yeah. That's that's yeah. a potential implication. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a, it's not an area I'm sort of specialised in yeah. or haven't, like, read into deeply, but I can kind of high-level, yeah, give a... You can see how my brain's effort. working, though, because the, the next thing I start to think of is you get, say, within politics, you tend to get workers' parties, Right. The workers' parties who tend to want to represent the more working class, but they really also start to feel a little bit like a trade union themselves, whilst they're a political party. And strictly speaking, they're you would argue that they're more of a la- like like the Labour in the UK, they're more of a left wing kind of socialist party. But so when I start to hear about uh, libertarians talking about like you know the problems with the state and you know everyone being responsible for themselves and self sovereignty etc cetera, etc, cetera, I can also see how groups of people want to come together and and, and fight for collectively for themselves as a group of people, and therefore I can see why for certain people certain socialist policies feel good, and why it kind of socialist parties happen. Yeah, so I mean, look, I guess ultimately a lot of these things, they are feel-good policies, but they're not necessarily what result in good long-term economic growth. Mm. And because they do things like cause, as Dr. Robert Higgs has spoken about, is this concept of regime uncertainty, right? So if the government constantly changes the rules of the game, then businessmen feel a bit more anxious about investing. And so then Mm -hmm. they might now be more wary of going into that certain company or going into into this certain industry and then that might cause an overall you know downwards impact on that country's economic growth and prosperity so that's a quick example i think it's just and i think another common thing that a misunderstanding if you will about a lot of libertarian ideas is that oh if the government doesn't do it that means it's not going to be done at all right where where actually we would say no there's more like there are alternatives that would be done for that so a quick example would be, okay, the welfare state. 
There's a good book on this called From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State by David T. Beto. And in that book, he talks about how prior to the government's welfare state, they actually had these things called beneficial societies or mutual aid societies, and they would kind of do like private welfare. But there was a difference. They were known for teaching a certain like self-reliance and work ethic to people. And the aim was to try and get them up out of poverty and get them back into the you know workforce and that kind of thing. And this is another thing, even if you listen to Tom Woods, he touches on some of this stuff as well. He points out how if you look at how the poverty rate was falling until they started implementing the welfare state and then it kind of it leveled off and it stayed leveled off rather than kept falling. And so sometimes we, the way we would look at it is actually things were getting better, but then the state for different reasons, right? Not like deep dark conspiracy, but just for different reasons, politicians wanted to look good. So then they would come out and put out a program that that wasn't actually helping or was in many cases counterproductive and then the progress stalled. A bit like Chavez in Venezuela, I guess. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's uh, the extreme example. And uh, the sad thing is if you go back a few years, there were a lot of prominent you know, left-wingers who were saying, oh, isn't it so great? Look how good Venezuela. And then once it all turns into, you know, a nightmare, then they start saying, oh, no, that wasn't real socialism, right? And yeah. so the typical, <laughs> right, and so the typical way to think about that is, and in fairness, someone could say, well, hang on, Hong Kong and Singapore are not perfectly capitalist either. Why do you point to them? You know, that kind of thing. But I think the capitalist on this point has a better rejoinder. Reason being, we would say, look, yeah, sure, there's never been like perfectly anarcho-capitalism, but those places that went really close to it, they were actually pretty good places to live. They, they grew very quickly. People came out of poverty. You know, the, every time it's been really tried, people did well. Whereas every time socialism has been, quote unquote, tried, it's been a horrible, horrible failure, right? Now, yeah. the common rejoinder to that might be, oh, well, see, that wasn't true socialism. And so, I mean, the thing is, you end up going around in circles with the socialists on that because they just never accept that that was a true, real attempt of socialism. See, it's funny, if I went down the pub with some of my friends and we were talking about this and I put my Bitcoin libertarian Austrian economist hat on, I said, we should get rid of all social welfare. It doesn't help people. They'll look at me like I'm a monster. Like everybody expects that you have, you should have some form of social welfare. And do you know what? There's been the Conservative Party in the UK have clamped down on a lot of social programs in the UK. And the evidence shows that a lot more people have been pushed into poverty. That's a reality of it. I don't know what the long term impact is, whether that puts pressure on people to, you know, avoid the need for social welfare and actually go out and work harder to get a job. I don't know the impact. But what we have seen is a growth of kind of more private charitable social programs such as we have food banks. Now, they feel terrible. I mean, it must be shit to go to a food bank because you, you have the requirement. But I am pretty sure that a food bank program run by a charity or a private organization would be a much better run program than, say, one run by the government. It seems like anything that is privatized is usually run better than run by the government. Absolutely. So there's a few points here. I would say, first of all, consider the crowding out effect. Right now, people think, hey, my tax money is already going to the welfare state, so I don't need to do private charity. But if there were no welfare state, then it would be more incumbent on us. We would think, okay, no, actually, now we should give up more money for these private charities because there is no welfare state. So that's point one. Secondly, is just the point around effectiveness and efficacy. So I think the challenge is a lot of these government programs they end up rewarding failure. And they, if they fail, they just say, oh, well, it's because we didn't have enough budget or it's because we didn't have enough regulation. We just need one more regulation or we just need another million dollars and then everything will be fine, right? Whereas the free market actually drives towards success and it gives people a better incentive, right? And so this is coming back to a very Austrian point where we would say something like a free market and individuals and companies within the free market are subject to a profit and loss test. So that's how you know they are actually providing some kind of net social benefit because it means people are voluntarily giving their money to you for, you know, and so that is a much stronger assurance that what you are doing is socially beneficial and you know being valued by society in the aggregate, right? Like if you can do it at a profit, then in that sense, you are kind of making more than you're losing. It's, it's an indicator, right? Whereas with the government, it tends to just have this ability, well, it does have this ability 
you know, as Hans Hermann Hopper calls it, it's the territorial monopoly of taxation and ultimate decision making, right? So if they fail, they can just tax you more. And so it just creates this really bad downward spiral. Whereas in a free market world, we think it's like this virtuous upward cycle. And uh, some of this plays into even some of the ideas that obviously Safetyne touches on and many others such as Guido Holzman touches on around this idea of time preference and what it, the impacts, the cultural and spiritual consequences of fiat money on society are. And some of that is, well, this big government is in part or very much so funded by debt. What's enabling that debt is fiat money, the, this massive bond, this market for bonds. And so the government is able to sell bonds into that market because there's a, you know all this cheap credit out there. And that is what helps the government fund all these big state welfare and warfare programs. And so in a world absent that cheap funding for the state, we believe that it would be more of an equity-based society and people would think more of their future and they would be more careful in some sense because the safety nets that would exist in a private free market world would be a little more geared towards getting you back up onto your own two feet rather than in the government welfare world where it is less personalized and it's more you just get it anyway even if you're an asshole right whereas in like the private system you have to be nice to your neighbors because they're the ones paying into that private welfare system so if you're an asshole to them they all just say hey why why are we giving money to this guy right so it force it drives nicer behaviors and it drives better behaviors that's what we would say on that point yeah so the time preference thing is really interesting and i've definitely noticed it impact me I've definitely noticed that I am consuming less. I'm saving more. I'm saving more than I have in my entire life. I am considering every single purchase I make now. I'm going, do I really need this? And that's definitely had an impact on me. But also at the same time, me and Safe have had a couple of disagreements about things recently with regard to this because I at the same time disagree with him on art. Right On art, I fundamentally disagree with him that mo- all modern art is rubbish. I think art is subjective and personal, but you know that's, that's absolutely fine. But also what I've noticed with not just SAFE, but plenty of other people, is that it's built this almost massive distrust of the state. Almost anything that the state says is potentially a lie or potentially manipulation. You know, I am, I am really struggling at the moment with climate change, as an example. Yeah. I now cannot find the truth in climate change. I can't find it because... I will go onto something like, I don't know, Greenpeace website, and I'll re- read what they're saying about climate change. I'll read everything that I'm finding with reference to uh, scientific studies. 97% of scientists agree that climate change is real. It seems real. There's lots happening. But then I'll also see other people talk about this is about control. We've always had climate change. We've always had cycles. And it's not that I disagree or agree with anyone now. I don't know where to find the truth. I just, I'm like, how how do you find the truth in this? Because for every position, there is a counter argument. And every counter argument also comes with a little bit of shame. Like, well, hold on, are you a statist? If you believe in climate change, <laughs> you're a statist. You're, you're just repeating what the state wants you to. You're being controlled. You're being manipulated. But at the same time, if we're wrong about climate change, it's a big fucking problem. So I'm. it's not that I disagree. I fundamentally agree with time preference. I think it's a really interesting concept. I think it's something we should teach our children. But at the same time, I worry if there's now, potentially, it goes too far. Right. So on climate change, it's a good question. I think one thing that's very commonly missed is an economic assessment of these actions, right? So here's the thing. Even if, let's say, okay, everything's going to be so bad in 50, 60, 100 years, whatever, what's the best response to that, right? And so one of the things that I would be quite skeptical of is this idea that the government is the one that can coordinate the action because that ends up being backdoor socialism, right? They tried through the front door and then they failed, right? And then so then now they're trying backdoor socialism. They're trying to say, oh, well, we need a carbon tax and we'll control your business via this backdoor way or we need some other intervention or we need the government to come in and, you know, it, and that is where you would say, hold on, hold on, hold on. The government, again, does not face a profit and loss test. What would actually be a superior response is a market-based response, right? So quick examples of this would be look at the prices of land near the ocean, near the coasts, or coastal land, right? Uh, what would the futures on that be, right? And let people 
respond in a, in their own voluntary way, and in doing so, they will consider their own individual costs and benefits around this. And uh, if you want to take this even further, right? So look at some of the work by. Bob Murphy at the IER, and he's done some analysis on things like a quick example. He would look at the IPCC numbers, literally the intergov, you know, the the actual organization, and even on their own terms, he would say, "Well, hold on, like actually, we would be better letting uh, because it's ultimately it comes to a cost of what is going to be the cost of trying to reduce the emissions, right? In that example, and what would be the benefits of that? Well." Fundamentally, there's not that much benefit to it because the amount, right? And what we're talking about here is the amount of uh, cost that it would cost our societies to dramatically restrict our emissions for not even a uh, guarantee that we will mitigate all the impacts. Whereas if we were to like basically let our economy grow much, so so much faster that we would be dramatically more wealthy in 50 or 60 years and that our kids and grandkids would be much, much wealthier and well-positioned to deal with any change that were to come, even if that were the case. Understand me? Yeah, I think it comes with a lot of risk, though, because, you know, what if we're wrong? And also, there's another thing. I, yeah, I understand your point on the economic argument. This is where I start to think about there is a moral requirement to consider these things. So, And this is where I struggle sometimes with free markets. Imagine a completely free market, but the free market includes takes out conservation you know the free market for animals and species right so we have a market for agriculture we have a market for meat we have cows you you can produce cows you can provide steaks and people can eat right but we have certain restrictions on things you know whether they're domestic or internationally say for example for the protection of certain animals if we didn't have if we had a full free market we would wipe out potentially a number of species of sharks. I've recently watched a documentary, say, about shark fin soup, you know, and I can't remember the name, but it's it's really worth watching. And, you know, if we had a free market for ivory, you know, we'd potentially wipe out elephants. So how does that fit into all of this? Because sometimes I think we don't want to state, but do we only, can we only protect certain animals and can we only protect certain species and parts of the environment by having a state and having some kind of moral regulation? Right. So my suggestion on that would be, firstly, we have to consider there is actually a thing, there is such a thing as free market environmentalism. And what we should think about is, again, who has the incentive to care, right? And if somebody, and typically this is one of those things where if you, again, this is another common argument about things like legalized hunting of animals and things like that, because then if they were legalized and if they were permitted to actually farm those animals, that would actually help the species be maintained. Were well, those ones that people you know really wanted to, and if they were, I guess, technically feasible to maintain. But then the, what, one problem that we see when you know the government tries to do these things is it ends up just being a political football, right? It beca- ends up being a political game: who wins what, who wins what piece of the pie, who gets to do what. And so that's one thing that we would suggest on that. And also even on the diet thing as well, right? Like we would say. There have been certain government interventions and certain, yeah, basically certain government interventions that drove us down certain pathways, right? And so, Safe Dean would speak about this as like fiat food, right? So, look at yeah. his, uh, the tr- yeah, and he would talk about how, you know, there's this guy, uh, Ansel Keys, right? And so, how he basically came out and kind of put up some dodgy maths and dodgy statistics to make his case look more legit. And so, it may- basically made it look more like, you know, we should be eating a lot of carbs and so on. And this gets into, again, a bit of the Bitcoin carnivore argument as well, right? Yeah. So part of the argument on this would be that actually, if we were to move back to a world with like the Alan Savory style management of, you know, life cycle management and use of cows as a way to actually help greenify the world, then that's another example where we have been pushed into a pathway as a result of government and government interference in certain ways, so certain funding for certain research and certain academic gatekeepers as well, who at that time were influential and drove the nutritional guidelines in a certain direction to say, oh, you've got to have, you know, cereals and bread at the bottom of your food pyramid instead of, whereas most of us are more about, you know, the carnivore lifestyle and we want to, you know, eat some steaks. And we believe that's actually 
more nutritious and it's quite a disservice that the government is doing to our health because it's driving so many people into diabetes and obesity and heart disease and you name it. So, yeah, I mean, a bit of a, a, bit of a, right. a winding answer, but hopefully that helps. Next up, I talk to Stefan more about Austrian economics, libertarianism and Bitcoin. But before that, let's hear from my amazing sponsors, the companies that make this happen. So firstly, today's show is also brought to you by Kraken, the mighty Kraken, the single best place to buy and sell Bitcoin. And they also have the best set of tools for you traders out there. We already know that Kraken has the best security in the market. I've discussed this for months with you now. I also interviewed their chief security officer, Nick Pococo, which is an interview you definitely want to check out. So you know you can trust Kraken, but they've also got all the tools out there that you traders need. They've got Kraken.com, the best place to buy, sell and trade digital currencies. They offer margin trading with up to 5x leverage. They've got futures, they've got indices, and they're crushing it with their Kraken OTC desk for large trades, private and personalized services. And they've got Crypto Watch, where you can trade on multiple crypto exchanges from a single platform. And if you're one of those advanced traders out there, they also have the best account management service that you can ask for. So there really is no better company to buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin with. Join me in supporting Kraken. Head over to kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. Also, today's show is brought to you by BlockFi, and as the end of the month approaches, I look forward to my next payout. My interest account is working for me, and despite the initial concerns, it's working. Every month I get my interest payments, and BlockFi are delivering. I know a few of you have taken out some interest accounts. How are you finding it? would be great to hear from you. would love to hear your feedback, but I love it that my Bitcoin is working for me every month. I love the integration of traditional financial services with Bitcoin. With a BlockFi interest account, you can earn interest on Bitcoin, ETH, and GUSD, and they also have their crypto back loans, where you can take out a loan against your Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin. Also, make sure you do check out my interviews with BlockFi CEO. I've done three now. I had my first one a long time ago. That was like episode 51, I think. I also interviewed him alongside Jeremy Welch. And if you are interested in the interest accounts, then there's an interview about those, which is on my SoundCloud, which you should check out as well. But if you are interested in, in trying out either their interest account or one of their loans, head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. I'll tell you where it's all coming back to. It, it all comes back to, and it reminds me of something Eric Voorhees said about having less government. <laughs> Every year we get more and more government, but actually what we need is less government. And... I'm not aware of, you might correct me and say there is, but I'm not aware of any libertarian party that's ever won an election. But it's not to say it couldn't happen. You know, we've seen over the last at least decade a fast rise of far right parties to, who are having political clout. We've seen it in France, we've seen it in Germany, we've seen it in the UK. So there's nothing to say we won't see some kind of revolution, some kind of change in, in where people will start, I, I guess. Finding the appeal of libertarianism, maybe start voting for a libertarian party. So, in an ideal world, just say in, in let's let's pick. We'll go with Australia. Just say we have the rise of a libertarian party. They take power. What are the things you th- you would like to see change? What are the key things that you would see policy changes with regard to government, with, with regards to individuals that you would like to see happen? Oh, I mean, <laughs> where do I where do I start? Uh, look, yeah. as uh, as the great Stefan Kinsella says, lower my goddamn taxes. I think number one would just be find ways to cut spending, right? And find ways to cut regulation. I would say probably one and two. They're probably the key things. Obviously, ending central banking is a big factor. Um, intellectual property, obviously, is a big factor. Occupational licensing laws. They need to go. Basically, just try to look for places where you can cut the taxes and reduce the size of the government. Now, that said, I am quite skeptical of political action, right? So even though I'm a libertarian and I want, you know, the government to be smaller or zero in the anarcho-capitalist, you know, case, I think that's not what's actually going to happen. I think I don't think it's going to happen that way. I think it's going to be more like Bitcoin is just economic reality. It will assert itself onto the world, and those people who do not adopt it will you know the way i would the way i put it is you can either ride this wave or you'll get crushed by this wave so ultimately i think that is what's going to drive the size of government down and we're likely to see a world with many many smaller states and i would see that as a as an improvement on the current scenario right so we tend to talk about this idea of well the in the ideal case individual secession 
the right of secession down to an individual. But failing that, at least smaller and more localized versions of government preferable to this, you know, massive gargantuan state that's, you know, hundreds of kilometers away from you, staffed by all these politicians and bureaucrats who who don't know you. And so fundamentally, that's the other thing as well. If you think about what is really an impact in your day-to-day life, it's your local police department, it's your local courts, it's your local, like all, pretty much all the local decisions are being made and they're the ones that matter most to you. So that's one way I'd put it. Well, we're going to, we, I'm not going to let you off the hook without digging into that a bit deeper, but that goes back to my conversation with Giacomo because obviously in the UK we have the big Brexit fight at the moment, the big argument. We have many people who support Brexit and many people are anti-Brexit. Most of my uh, friends are anti-Brexit and trying to even discuss it with them, trying to explain to them like a smaller state is better, blah, blah, blah. I always get an attack back at me with points such as, well, you're going to reduce the free movement of people. You know, it's all based on lies of immigration. Uh, you're a Nazi, blah blah blah. All the same stuff coming back. Yeah, to me. yeah. But, I, but <laughs> I did, I did the conversation with Giacomo. At the end of it, I was like, okay, no, I'm, I'm pro Brexit now. I think Brexit's a good thing. I, I support it. So I guess you feel the same about Brexit. For us. Absolutely. I would say probably 98 or 99 percent of libertarians would be pro Brexit. There's probably like one or two percent hipster libertarians who think, Bre- you know, Brexit's a bad idea, but most of them would be pro it. Reason being, smaller is better. There's a great talk by Jeff Deist on this topic. It's called Smaller is Better, right? And part of the idea there is, again, the closer you bring it to you, it's kind of the closer you are to individual secession and the closer you are to you having s- some additional control and ability to impact what's going on in your own life. And part of that was, again, I can understand for the British people who wanted to feel like, hey, this is our country and we really control it instead of these, you know, unaccountable bureaucrats and all these people over there in, in the EU who are making all these decisions on our behalf and stopping us from trading, right? So for you guys, you can't do a free trade deal with Australia or Canada, for example, right? And now there's talk of that because, yeah. you know, Australia, Canada and, and these other countries, New Zealand, these other countries, we share a lot of cultural similarities and obviously the English language and so on. There's a lot of similarities there. So it's an increasingly global and digital world. Why wouldn't we try to have more and more free trade and open trade? So that's absolutely the libertarian position on that kind of thing. So you believe we can get to a point of no state and no taxes and it will be better for everyone? Well, do I think it'll happen in my lifetime? Probably not. No, right? I'm talking do more about it would, is be... it, would it be a good thing? Yes. Yes, right. I believe, fundamentally speaking, uh, a free market, anarcho-capitalist society would be more prosperous, it would be more just, you would have more choice, people would think more about their long term, we would probably care more about our families and our communities, whereas now the state sort of impedes that. It infantilizes our children, it makes our people grow up slower, it forces them down these occupational licensing pathways and, you know, it's very ask for permission, you know, you can't, you can't go out and innovate. Whereas we would see a society that would be not utopian, right? It's not a utopian vision, but it is a vision of a society that really balances people's individual costs and benefits better and you know allows for that individual choice. So fundamentally it's about having respect for private property rights and thinking okay what are some ways that we can solve this with additional private property rights and respect for private property rights as opposed to there ought to be a law, right? Which is kind of like the top-down statist kind of interventionist way of thinking about that. But do you, as a libertarian or other libertarians, ever debate the downside potential of this? And has it ever been tested? Because I can imagine in small groups in a village, a small town, this works very well. I try and think of a country with 300 million people and wonder, you know, would it be all out anarchy? Does it come with uh, other downsides? Like, you know, a lot of the conversations I've had with Americans recently is with regards to guns and the Second Amendment, and I totally understand what they're saying. At the same time, I don't want guns in my country. We don't really have them, and I don't really want them introduced. introduced. So do do you ever debate the downsides? Are there any risks that you as a libertarian identify, worry about if this was to happen? So, look, there are internal libertarian debates 
till the cows come home, right? right? Like there are massive, massive debates all all about a lot of these things, right? And so even amongst libertarians, you got the minarchist, small state ones. So for example, someone like Francis Pouliot, he's a mm. minarchist. And then there would be others who are more on the anarcho-capitalist side, right? So those people are always debating, right? And so there's there's a lot of different debates about these things, about things like could could an anarcho-capitalist society, could they do national defense, right? And there are debates about that, right? So absolutely, there's a lot of different questions on this. And I think it's probably, obviously, we're not going to solve them all in this podcast, mm. but I can give you just a rough outline on some of these yeah, things, right? So, you know, it's part of the thinking. And so there are some examples, not like full-blown anarcho-capitalism, but there are some historical examples. So someone like Roderick, Roderick T. Long has written on some of these examples of like, kind of chieftains in like certain Nordic countries. And I think the idea was, you know, you could live anywhere, but choose a different chieftain to be your representative for you. And that's a quick example. There are other books such as The Enterprise of Law by Bruce Benson or Private Governance by Edward Stringham and talking about this idea of what would market-driven law look like? What might that look like? And how could it be done? Or you could look at some of the work by Bob Murphy. He's got a pamphlet called Chaos Theory. Murray Rothbard's The Ethics of Liberty speaks about some of these points. Hans Hermann Hopper has a few essays on this kind of thing as well. I think it's called The Provision of National Defense or Private, yeah, something like that. I can't remember the exact title. But essentially, there have been many theorists as well who have spoken about this or looked at certain examples. Another one you might be interested in is this guy, Pete Leeson. He wrote a book about the anarchy that existed in Somalia. And what he was trying to do is look at, okay, well, hang on. Actually, Somalia, in that time that it was going was actually improving at a better pace than some of the other nations surrounding it. And so that's another quick example where private governance and private law can actually still provide a certain level of governance that we you know, might prefer to see. And so Again, as I'll, I'll just make sure to clarify here, it's not a utopian vision, right? But there are definitely concepts that we can look at and think about, well, hang on, how did people solve some of these issues in a way where they didn't have government recourse? So another one, Peter Leeson talks about even uh, pirates and how they had certain codes of conduct and laws amongst themselves and how did they resolve some of these issues? And so it's a really interesting thing when you sort of dive further into that world and look at some of the explanations about things. Another good one would be David Friedman's The Machinery of Freedom, which is a classic. And so that is also a classic in terms of anarcho-capitalism and understanding what might it look like. And so, yeah, so I guess there, there's just a few examples. Yeah, I, that, so you've touched on a couple of things that I do think about with this. So, you know, I get it with free markets. I get it with trade and business. It makes sense. I actually really like the idea of uh, free markets. But I, I do then think about, okay, law and order. You know, what happens? Do we have a police force? Is it a private police force? How How is it regulated? You know, if somebody steals from me, do they get their hands chopped off? Or do we have prisons? Like, how does that all operate there? I don't know how that works. And I also do think in terms of national defense, you know, is a country like this open itself up to being attacked? I, I wish there were no armies, right? <laughs> I wish no <laughs> money was spent on, on warfare. I don't like the fact my taxes are spent on drones and missiles to bomb people in the Middle East. I think it's bullshit. But at the same time, I do, I do worry, like, uh, how, what happens in this situation? So again, yeah, so I, again, I'll give a very quick answer. But for more detail, I would say look at, look on YouTube. There's a talk by Bob Murphy at the Mises Institute. It's called The Market for Security. And he pretty much does that every year at the Mises Institute, uh, at the Mises Seminar. But I'll give you kind of the high level summary of some of those points. So he talks about this idea of private law. A good analogy might be the English language or just language in general right? That there are certain rules. It's not arbitrary, right? Like, you know, the grammatical structure of our sentences and so on. There are certain rules. And yet at the same time, there's no top-down commander or king of the English language, right? It's just, it just evolves over time. And we have little emoticons and lol and whatever, you know, we say these things and language changes over time, right? So quick example would be, look at the dictionary. The dictionary merely codifies the law. They don't set or they set they codify the language they don't set the language and if if the dictionary came out with some example saying you know up was actually down we would say ha the we wouldn't say oh well the dictionary must be right i guess i better i've been saying it wrong the whole time well no we'd say ha these dictionary guys they got it wrong so same in the same kind of way 
there would be legal experts in a certain field. And yes, there would be disputes, but even now there are disputes and things go wrong. So even Ross Ulbricht, right? Like the, the government got that wrong, right? So we've totally got these wrong. examples where, you know, right now the government is getting it wrong. And so fundamentally we would see maybe a world where there might be legal experts in different things. There might be a, a legal expert for petty crime and a legal expert for residential property disputes and a legal expert for environment and like an illegal expert in the radio spectrum, broadcasting, etc. And that might be one part. And then another part might be uh, private police, private security. And so let's say somebody steals from you, you might go to a private court or private judge, and these people would have a reputation to uphold. And you might, you know, have your counterparty who you think the guy, this other guy stole it, you might say to this other guy, hey, look, there are 10 reputable judges on small crimes or small theft. I, I'm happy to go to any of these. Let's go. To, let's take this to court. And after a while, the community, if, if like, let's say the other guy was an ass and he just didn't go to court, it would start to look clear that, okay, this guy's not willing to go to court and prove himself. Like, okay. And so th- these are just some examples, right? And so let me just touch on the national defense part as well. So the key, I guess the quick way to think about that would be insurance, right? So you got this little town or this little area, right? And first, first, of all, first of all, take a step back. Let's understand that what we're comparing to here is not perfection, right? Because even now with government, um, there are states that lose in a war against other states, right? So there are some nation, national defenses that failed, right? So that's, yeah, again, so yeah. we've got to remember, it's like a good comparative would be a, small, a, certain, a similar sized anarcho-capitalist society versus a similar sized statist society for, for want of a better word right and so theoretically there you know if you've got a big building you've got a big skyscraper you, you put millions of dollars into building it well you're going to need to get insurance on that right the same way you would have fire insurance and whatever terrorism and whatever you you might have some kind of national defense right and so and in the same way that an insurance company might say hey peter if if i want to if you want me to insure your home against fire I want you to install sprinklers. And if you install sprinklers, I'll give you a discount on your premium. Same way, a national defense, there might be national defense agencies who say, okay, well, we want before we insure you, we want you to have this level of counterterrorism or this level of surface-to-air missile defense. You know, like you can sort of see where I'm going with this idea, right? And especially in a world where we're moving towards, which is a lot of the wealth is not theoretically physical a lot of that's human capital right and Mm -hmm. so if someone wanted to try and invade england or whatever probably a lot of the wealth would be in people's minds the intellectual ability and capability of people and so there's less and less to be gained by conquest now and more more and more to be gained by trade and so that's kind of the fundamental way we would approach that problem and think about it which is fundamentally it's cheaper and better to trade with people than to go to war for them go to war with them about it and even still there would be mechanisms that may act to provide something akin to national defense as it exists today see the thing is like every time i talk to somebody like yourself or safe about uh, Austrian, econ- uh, Austrian economics or libertarianism everything just makes sense i listen to them like it just makes sense okay this makes sense so why isn't this more popular is there any studies into like is this kind of anti-human is it is it just natural for humans to organize themselves in a way of leaders and followers and we have people with big egos and perhaps narcissists who want to lead people and into lead in leading people they they end up creating rules and such is that just like a natural way humans evolve because whilst the state is obviously especially like in my country or you know america or even worse russia china it's clearly in many cases evil many cases done awful terrible things and lie to us etc but i don't also at the same time believe there's like a group of people in an underground bunker saying let's control the people yeah so is this just a natural way humans have evolved is this you know is there any studies into that None directly on that, but I would say, uh, and this is something I've seen someone mention this wording, and I liked it. It's this idea of conspiracy without conspirators, right? It's just everyone is playing to their own best interests, right? The politician is just looking for ways to imp- in- to expand his empire. The business bureaucrat, again, they want to look like they've got a big department. So it's it just all of it 
drives this expansion in the state. And that's if you read Hans Hermann Hopper, he'll speak about some of these points about how it just, you know, the worst people tend to rise to the top in this sort of system. And so that's just kind of how it goes, you know. And so if you look at some other people like, say, Jonathan Haidt, he's done work on personality types and what that drives. And typically, like, a libertarian type of person tends to be a little bit more analytical. They're the most analytical out of kind of, if you look at, like, political orientation and things. Libertarians tend to be that sort of type. Now, in my view... The system has been such that it just has, as Dr. Robert Higgs talks about, this ratchet effect, right? It just expands a little and it doesn't go back down. And it expands a little and it doesn't go back down. And that was in uh, Crisis and Leviathan, right? And so I think uh, fundamentally that's why many of us Bitcoiners, w- many of us were libertarians more politically about it, uh, active, but we just grew disillusioned in it because we actually think Bitcoin is what's going to drive this change much more than actual direct political action. Because what does it take for someone to become a libertarian? They've got to go and do all this reading. They've got to do it. They've got to like watch videos, listen to podcasts, like learn. And most people are not interested in that. It's fundamentally like you need to have enough wealth that you can afford to spend the time doing that. And then you've got to be willing enough. You've got to be disagreeable enough. You've got to be willing enough to like buck the trend, be the unpopular person. Why would you, you know, it's not the path, it's, it's not the path of least resistance, right? <laughs> Well, so, listen, look, yeah. how, many, how many books and talks have you recommended to me in this, what, what have we done, an hour and 15 minutes so far? Yeah. Yeah. I reckon it's at least 10 or 15 books or talks. Like, I don't have the time to do them all. I don't. I've got, oh, yeah. um, I've got, I've got Rothbard's book downstairs. I still not opened it, so don't hate me. But at least I went, took the step and bought it, and I'm going you know, to read it. But it's a lot to take on board. I mean, look, you're in. You know this through and through. This is in your DNA. Like, you can talk about this coherently you can talk about this like i can talk about heavy metal right you've got it you're coherent you know it all what's it like with your friends like <laughs> how, explaining this? How, how do they find do they think you're like some wacky libertarian or, or have you made progress like have you converted people i would say i some of my friends some of my close friends now are libertarians is because i met them through libertarian circles and stuff but my non libertarian friends yeah, definitely. I think some of them I have, but others I've just kind of let them be because I, I try I try to here and there bring it up, but I don't want to be overbearing about it. Same with Bitcoin as of well, course. right? Like, you know, it's kind of like I'm there available if they've got any questions and they know they can always come and ask me about, you know, Bitcoin or whatever. But I try to not be too overbearing, right? Even though I, I share, I obviously I post a lot of the material on Twitter and everywhere, right? But I don't expect... Like if if we're just hanging out socially, I don't necessarily bring it up, right? Yeah, well, I I do. <laughs> <laughs> I bring it up all the time. The only time people take an interest, especially with Bitcoin, is when the price goes up. But okay, so what's stopping libertarianism growing? Like like I said to me, it just makes sense. Is it is it because people are brainwashed into kind of two party politics? You know, there's a left and the right, which has got a lot worse recently. Is it that what's stopping the growth of this? Well, I think a big part of it is just the government education system teaches people in a very statist way, right? So you just grow mm-hmm. up in that, right? It's the, You're a fish and this is just the water you're swimming in. You don't even realize that's the water you're swimming in. And it's been the progressive century, right? Like we've seen the last hundred years, the governments of, around the world have expanded so much. If you looked at almost what some of the progressives like a hundred years ago were saying, they, they probably succeeded beyond their wildest dreams in terms of how much more government we have today. In terms of why is it not successful, I think it, it comes back to those points I was saying, like, the system is set up in such a way that, you know, it's not a conspiracy. It's not like a conspirator sense. It's more just like that's just every person is playing to their best interest and that tends to result in this expansion of the state and expansion of government surveillance and financial surveillance and all of this. And, you know, in my view, I think it's not going to change until Bitcoin forces that change. All right, well, listen, I've got one more question about Austrian economics before we move on to talking a little bit about Bitcoin. But the one thing that comes up consistently that I hear you reference, I hear Tom Woods reference, is always starts with property rights. Everyone talks about the importance of property rights. But can you explain it? Look, I obviously know what it means, but can you explain what it really means? Tough one. So I would say here's the thing. Every political philosophy has some theory of property rights. It's that the libertarians and the Austrian libertarians specifically have a specific theory of what those should be, right? And so we're talking about private property rights. And so if you look at, say, Hans Hermann Hopper, he would explain something like the first comer, right? So the idea is the person who was the first to that should be the rightful owner of it. And you should either be the first to it or the 
legitimate owner of it through trade, right? Sorry, let me take a step back. Why do we have these property rights? Ultimately, it's because we have certain means that we want to achieve, but th- there's scarcity in the world, right? There's only so many, you know, whatever, land and whatever. So fundamentally, the only way to resolve that and ha- you know, not have conflict over these scarce resources is to assign property rights. And so this is if you read uh, Rothbard's The Ethics of Liberty uh, or hans Hermann Hopper's work on some of this stuff as well, a theory of socialism and capitalism, for example. That's kind of what they're getting at. They're saying, look, ultimately, if we want to be able to peacefully coexist in this world, we need ways to apportion those property rights. And I think a lot of the Austrians would sort of say, well, without private property rights, you can't correctly can calculate the costs and benefits of things. And without doing that, we can't have like a naturally functioning society because fundamentally speaking, it just becomes more of a political game, right? Then it becomes, oh, I like, this is my mate or that's my brother or that's my sister, that's my mom. I'm going to be, I'm going to give them favors. I'm going to give them better property. And fundamentally, that's just, you know, the, the that's been unfortunately the way of the world. It's become very politicized whereas we think of it more like democracy really is just like a soft version of socialism right and that that's how hopper explained it and that's how many of us think of it really it's just a soft socialism and that really the more precise way to go about this is to assign a property right and then respect that property right does that make sense to you yeah no it, it does and it brings up two questions actually one thing it made me think was Politics is something we don't need. Politics is a barrier. Absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah we, would, we would agree with that. Like, I think we want to see a, a world where politics is less important, where it matters less. And personally, even for, as I've grown up, I've seen more and more things become politicized, right? Like as a kid, people might go to the football game or whatever, and it wouldn't have been so politicized. And people might be, say, fans of the same team, but you know, politically have differences, but they didn't care because they set that aside and we were just here to watch the game kind of thing. Whereas nowadays, it's everything's getting politicized. And now it's like, you got to wear the right color shirt and you got to do the right thing. And it, this is one of the dangers, if anything, of an increasingly or overly politicized society as opposed to one where, you know, a private property ethic is reigning. Right, okay. And the other thing it made me think of... Are your private keys a very good example of property rights? Oh, okay. So this one depends who you ask. On uh, Actually, if you look at, uh, if you listen to Stefan Kinsella, um, I had him on and spoke about this exact concept. And he was basically saying you actually can't own Bitcoins. And I know that's very <laughs> weird in some sense. Um, but he, what, he's, because they're not physical. Because they're not physical yeah. and in your person. Exactly. So, and this is part of Stefan Kinsella's argument uh, against intellectual property as well, because they're not scarce, they're not rivalrous. So, anyway, that's another whole kettle of fish. We don't have to go you know, go into that, but that's his argument. Uh, I think it's yeah. So, I think look, the way to kind of square this circle is essentially just be sure that you are the only one who controls them, right? So, even if you are theoretically not owning the bitcoins, just make sure you're the only one who controls the private keys to those bitcoins. Obviously to stop yourself getting stolen from. Okay, but let's imagine, let's forget what Stephen Kinsella says. Essentially, your private keys assign the property rights to those Bitcoin to you. Sort of. It's more like we would say in Bitcoin, the private keys are what enable you to spend those Bitcoins. They were, you know, they right, allow okay. you, you know, but it's, I guess, if you wanted to be get really precise about it, it might well be that you can't technically, in some sense, own Bitcoin, but really it's more like you're the only one who can control them. All right, okay. Well, look, let's go back a few years. How long have you been studying libertarianism? Like, when did it become part of your life? Was it as a teenager? Was it your adult life? Yeah, actually, I was I was like 14 or 15, right? So basically, right, okay. you know, over half my life at this point. I was hanging out on IRC, right, Internet Relay Chat, and uh, I was on some Australian politics channel, and I, I, I was a little bit, I didn't really know, you know, obviously as a kid, you haven't really been politically well developed. You're just sort of whatever. And this guy kept linking to Mises Daily articles, right? And so at first I just thought, oh, what the hell? That's all crazy. Anarcho-capitalism, that would never work. Wouldn't gangs take over? Wouldn't warlords take over? All this stuff, right? All these different things. And slowly but surely, as I read some of those articles, and then I compared that back to what I was learning at school in economics class and stuff like that. The Austrian stuff just made so much more sense to me, right? It just, it was just, and I think it was not something I could grasp 
precisely why that was, but I think later I understood that more. And I think it's precisely that the Austrian method is a little bit more methodical and systematic. And so there's a certain deductive reasoning and way, like procedural method to it. And that was something that appealed to me because it just felt so intuitively, it just made common sense. But I think the reason for that was it, it just, it was a lot more logically coherent and consistent. That was my experience. And then kind of going further down that rabbit hole, the Austrian economics and libertarianism rabbit hole is essentially, I just listened to different podcasts. I read different articles. I read the books, obviously. So that was my journey down that. Right. Okay. So along that journey though, along came Bitcoin, right? Well, Bitcoin came after for me, right? Like I was already Yeah, that's in. what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You're already in, but during this journey of like the last what I, I don't know how old you are, but say the last whatever 10 to 15 years, during that journey along came Bitcoin, right? And you've obviously mixed in libertarian circles, you've discussed this with people, but in some ways it feels like you've suddenly got a tool which is really useful for opening the door to Austrian economics to people, libertarianism. It feels like in some ways it's become a great marketing tool for these kind of principles. Somewhat, yeah, yeah, that's right. I would say one thing with that is there were a lot of libertarians who didn't come into Bitcoin. But the funny thing is now there are some people who got into Bitcoin and then got into libertarianism and Austrian economics from that side of it, Yeah, right? I mean, for me, my kind of come to Bitcoin moment was actually an Eric Voorhees article in late 2012. I stumbled across an article by Eric Voorhees and that was my like, whoa, you know, up until that, like I'd heard of Bitcoin before. I'd like seen it on like Slashdot or whatever, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. It was December 2012, reading that Eric Voorhees article that actually got me into it. So you went out and bought hundreds and hundreds of Bitcoin. At that <laughs> <moment>. <laughs> I <laughs> wish, I wish. <laughs> Don't we all wish? You know, I, I'm actually a huge fan of Eric's and I like, I know he's got some critics for what happened with the New York agreement and I know Shapeshift allows for the trade in shit coins, but I'm a huge fan of Eric's. I love talking to him about this stuff. So I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm glad that's how you came in. Okay, so at one point during that, Bitcoin clicked for you with Eric's article. Did it immediately click as something that was aligned with both libertarianism and Austrian economics, what, what was it that really kind of made you go, ah, this is important? Absolutely, it was those things, right? So in that article, I can't remember the exact title. I think it's something like a libertarian introduction to Bitcoin, right? So it's, he wrote it okay. for a libertarian, right? So obviously <laughs> it hit the right notes to get a libertarian in, right? So that for me was seeing, because obviously I was already skeptical of central banking. I was skeptical of fiat money. And then this was like, wow, okay, this is like, this whole parallel system that could exist and people could use it right now. Obviously, in those days when I was first encountering it, it was more like a, it was more like an asymmetric bet, right? I thought of it more like that. I thought of it more like, hey, let's, you know, as the famous Satoshi words are, you know, it might make sense to get some in cases, in case it catches on, right? And then as I slowly got further into it, and then I, you know, I started reading different articles by, say, Tour de Mista, uh, back then, Conrad Graff, Pierre Richard, Michael Goldstein, Daniel Krawitz back then, uh, and some others, and Trace Mayer as well. And then so that was what made me become even more and more bullish on it. And then in some sense, that made me go back and read further into some of those Austrian monetary economics components of it as well. Because I'd read, you know, basically most of the Austrian kind of big, big name books, but i hadn't had as much of a focus on the monetary economic side of it. And so it was kind of after getting into that, that I went back and kind of reread and looked some looked a little more deeply into some of these ideas, such as Deflation and Liberty by Guido Hulsman, The Ethics of Money Production by Guido Hulsman, uh, and various other concepts around things like deflation and, you know, a lot of those Austrian monetary economics concepts that help us perceive Bitcoin. Okay, that's really interesting. It clicked for you, right? Immediately. You bought into it. You understood it. What are the key things that Bitcoin therefore offers to people? Like, what is it going to improve? What does it change? What does it change the game for everyone? Well, I mean, fundamentally, I mean, it's, I mean, it's stuff that you can get from reading the Bitcoin standard, right? But ultimately, it's this idea of this really hard money, the supply cap, the fact that it can be sent anywhere around the world at the click of a button. It should be compared mostly, to, as Safety does, to this idea of settling gold internationally at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time, right? And so that is the real, in my view, the correct, you know, a smarter way to think of Bitcoin. And 
that is fundamentally why it may succeed where gold got co-opted in the past. So that's kind of how most of the, what I would call the Bitcoin Austrians, right? So Safedean and Pierre and Michael Goldstein and VJ and some of these other guys, they they would speak of it in that term, right? Like they would think of it like, well, look, gold got co-opted and because there were other systems operating on top of gold, the government could just co-opt that and kind of turn that into its own machinery. Whereas Bitcoin has certain characteristics about it that are resistant to that kind of manipulation. And so we may see a world with thousands and thousands of banks, uh, Bitcoin banks, right? And in some sense, when you run your Bitcoin full node and your Lightning node on top of that Bitcoin full node, in some sense, you might help become a financial institution in the future. And you might open channels and let's say you've got people doing channel management and you might run apps for other people to you know even be a customer of your bank right and hopefully now this comes into this idea of how accessible is a full node and hopefully it remains very very accessible for people to set up their own full node both bitcoin and lightning and whatever else comes and hopefully then that helps maintain this decentralized money. And that is how we see it playing out over time because it's kind of like, it's just hard money. It's just economic reality that's just asserting itself onto the world. And, you know, it doesn't really matter that much what you or I say or do about it. And no one person is that important, really, right? Like whether you're a big podcaster or you're a nobody, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, this thing is just going to get adopted because it's just a superior money. And in a world where there's all this monetary craziness out there, right, you're seeing like negative rates, we're seeing financial surveillance, we're seeing all the sorts of repression and controls, things like AML and sanctions, and where did you get that money from? And what's the source of funds? And uh, who are you sending it to? KYC them and KYC you and KYC that, this, that and the other. In that world, wouldn't it make sense to have this hard money that can be sent anywhere and can't be easily stopped? And that is fundamentally the bullish, you know, in some cases, that's the bullish argument for Bitcoin is that it's just, it's just this massive asymmetric bed of a lifetime or of a species, as Trace Mayer says. Yeah. Well, and the bullish case for Bitcoin, as Vijay says, yeah. his amazing article, which I'll share out as part of this. So is this where the Bcashers go wrong then? Because they just think of it purely as a way of settling an individual trade. I want to buy A from B. I want to do it as quickly as possible. Therefore, Bcash makes sense. Whereas they're, what they're missing is the bigger point that this can actually change the entire system. Absolutely. So I like the way Giacomo Zucco put this one. So he was saying, look, you got the Bcashers and then the Bitcoiners, right? And the Bcashers, they thought of it like, oh, hey, we want decentralization of transactions, right? We want it to be super cheap for people to do coffee on the blockchain. Whereas... The Bitcoiners were more like, no, no, hold on, hold on. We need to maintain the overall decentralization of validation or of verification, right? Hence where the full node part comes in, right? Because your full node in Bitcoin helps you ensure that the rules of Bitcoin were not broken and that, yes, you correctly did receive Bitcoins and so on. Whereas the Bcashers were thinking of it too much in a transactional sense rather than viewing it more like certain characteristics of the system's decentralization must be preserved. And so a few quick examples there were things like people like Adam Back or Christian Decker, they would make this argument that, look, if you raise the block size too much, you will impact block propagation and you will impact the ability of the network to remain in consensus. And it's very important because obviously we want this decentralized money to continue existing and be a long-term sustainable thing. Well, obviously, the network has to be able to stay in consensus and it needs to be accessible for people to verify, right? Whereas the Bcashers were more like, no, no, I just want cheap transactions. And in the Bitcoin of view, those Bcashers were essentially placing too much risk on centralization and placing too much power and control into the miners because that's essentially what it ends up doing and it ends up also driving a certain centralization in the way those miners operate because of the block propagation there are certain limits imposed by the speed of light such that it would drive centralization in the mining whereas what we want for bitcoin is decentralized mining in multiple ways decentralization in terms of location of the mining decentralization in terms of like mining pools and also the manufacture of the mining equipment. We want that. We want all of those things to be well decentralized or sufficiently decentralized. And so that is fundamentally what gives Bitcoin its government resistance. And if it's not government resistant, I think you've basically given up the game. Yeah, it's government resistant in terms, I guess, of control 
of the protocol, controller decisions, etc. But it's it's not proving resistant in terms of privacy at the moment. We you know you've talked about KYC, AML, government want that wanting their taxes from Bitcoin, although obviously paid in fiat. It'd be interesting if we got to a point where the government wanted their taxes paid in Bitcoin. That would be very interesting. <laughs> but do you do you think it's inevitable? if Bitcoin continues to grow, that it will destroy fiat? And also, do you think it's essential for Bitcoin to destroy fiat? Or do you think we'll end up with kind of a dual currency system? You know, I've just been out to Cambodia, and they op- operate with dual currencies. They operate with the dollar, and they operate with the real. And it's quite interesting, like in that scenario that I was living in, it felt like the dollar was their Bitcoin. Like that was their hard money. It was a really interesting experience. Oh, I'm sure that would have been fascinating, right? Because you're seeing almost like that dollarization, right? Uh, and mm-hmm. and when it gets really, really bad, that's what happens in some of these countries, right? You get the monetary hot potatoes effect, and then they start using dollars instead of their other, whatever their fiat shitcoin is, right? And so our view on this, the Bitcoin Austrian view would essentially be that there's just going to be a tendency, a tendency of convergence, right? So if if you look at uh, Mises in Theory of Money and Credit, there's a section, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's something like, um, one by one, commodities will be rejected, uh, the less saleable ones, until you're kind of getting to the most saleable one. And so that would be, I guess, the convergence argument towards the one best money. Now, as Safety points out, there are certain fa- risk factors, one of which would be the government just simply instituting a gold standard, right? Maybe a government, it's unlikely, but it's a possibility. The government might say, well, fine. We need to impose some level of control on ourselves and restraint on ourselves. We're going to have to go back voluntarily to a gold standard. Now, even there, you might say, well, people might not trust the government and they might still preserve, prefer to go with Bitcoin because they, Bitcoin has a known supply ex- emission schedule rather than the government, which might, again, just pull a 1971 on your ass and just <laughs> remove the constraint, which was meant to be a temporary uh, closure of the gold window, right? But as right. Milton Friedman says, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. <laughs> you know what the interesting about that interview, the last one I did was safe as well. He talked about, quite interestingly, the biggest threat to Bitcoin is government operating a a responsible fiscal policy. And it never even crossed my mind. But Bitcoin might end up becoming such a threat that it enforces proper fiscal policy from government. I never really crossed my mind, but I still think I would own a bit of Bitcoin then. Yeah, so I think um, it would probably be more closely related to the monetary policy, which is the issuance yeah. of new money. Sorry, yes, fiscal, yes. Yeah, but yeah, no, but I think absolutely that's, that's the, I think that's the argument that Safetyne presented in uh, the Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin number five and also on my podcast and on your podcast. So yeah, that's one argument. Look, I think the other argument though is also just simply that people just keep adopting Bitcoin as a parallel system, right? It's just this parallel system where we're all just upgrading to it because we're leaving the worst one behind. And that's increasingly the way many Bitcoiners are thinking about this now. They're starting to think, well, fine, uh, the government is screwing it up. The government is going to fail on its, under its own steam, right? Bitcoin isn't even doing this. The government is just doing it to itself. And we just need a viable alternative. And right now, Bitcoin is the best alternative. And you're fully bought in, obviously, now. You're a massive Bitcoiner. You're a globally successful Bitcoin podcaster. <laughs> I, I, I won't call you an influencer. <laughs> Never like that word. All right, man. Well, listen, look, we are, we are, I mean, I think we could do another five hours, but listen, I'm conscious of time. So a couple of things I want to close out on. We both recently interviewed Rao Pao. What a interesting guy. What a great interview. Uh, yours was really helpful for me to prep for mine. So thank you for that. There's a lot of doom and gloom with the global economy. I think rightly so. I think uh, I've spoke to Caitlin Long a couple of times. The things she's predicted are looking like they're coming true. Do you see this as a real test for Bitcoin? I'm hesitant to say an opportunity because I don't want to see a collapse in the global economy as as like, hey, yay, Bitcoin's great now because it's, I don't know, there'll be a lot of suffering with that. But do you see this as an interesting testing time for Bitcoin? For sure. I think uh, if you look at, say, Plan B's work, he has spoken about how this next coming year or two will be, in some sense, a test of some of his work with like the regression and stuff you might have seen. And absolutely, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. It, it, may, it may even be that, you know, Bitcoin doesn't rise this kind of down uh, in terms of the depression or whatever, if we were to hit some kind of financial recession or whatever, maybe it's the next one, who knows. But 
I just fundamentally think there is a tendency towards the best money. And I think more and more people are learning that and more and more people are coming around to that idea and it's becoming easier and easier to set up with Bitcoin. Obviously, there are difficulties and there's a lot of work being done to make that easier in terms of like running your node, running Bitcoin and Lightning wallets and software. So yeah, my, my cautious yeah suggestion is, yeah, we'll be sort of a test if, if we do see a recession over the next year, let's say. But I agree with you, you know, it was great into your interview with Raul was great as well. And yeah, look, uh, it's ultimately it's not something we should be uh, happy about the recession coming. Obviously, it's more like a, a grim realization or uh, acceptance that this is coming. And we have to now try to do something about it. And what's the best way to move on to something better? Well, in my view, and I presume your view as well, it's Bitcoin. Definitely, it's Bitcoin. All right, listen, last couple of questions for you before we close out. If somebody's new to Austrian economics and new to libertarianism and they kind of just want to dive in, give them a good starting point. Like the first couple of books, presentations, things you would recommend somebody go and check out. Obviously, I'm going to tell them to check out your podcast, but what are your kind of starting point recommendations? Yeah, for Austrian economics, I would say economics in one lesson. Uh, which is uh, much of this stuff is free on Mises.org. So, and they've got a lot of videos as well. So you can go and just click through some of those videos and just click around on what different topics you like. But some suggested books or articles and things to read, I would say, yeah, Economics in One Lesson. There's a good one called Lessons for the Young Economist, which is a free textbook by Bob Murphy. That's also free on Mises.org. And then... Yes, obviously the Bitcoin standard, that's, you know, taken as granted. The Ethics of Money Production is a fantastic book to read. How is Fiat Money Possible? A fantastic essay by Hans Hermann Hopper. Uh, Democracy, The God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hopper is also a great one. Um, Yeah, and then as you progress up, then you try to work your way to the magnum opus level texts, which are Human Action by Mises and Man, Economy and State by Murray Rothbard. So those are kind of like the top level texts and also from a banking point of view if you want to work your way up to that i would say this book by huerta de soto which is called money bank credit and economic cycles that's a fantastic book um so yeah i guess there, there are a few recommendations i would give um, but fundamentally if you just go to mises.org and just click around on there read some articles read some books a lot of them are free you can find a lot of material there i i owe a great debt to the mises institute i think uh, i owe so much to them to the, like as an institution and how much i've learned from them so i was you know very grateful to have jeff deist on the show and Guido hulsman as well and uh, you know i will hopefully be getting more more people from the mises institute on the podcast as well yeah definitely do that uh, do you know what side thing i've just remembered i forgot to tell you it might be of no interest to you at all but when i was out in vietnam i watched my first aussie rules game of football <laughs> yeah yeah how'd you find it do you uh chaos crazy <laughs> like i've like nothing i've ever seen before in my life I've, i'm like aware of it and i've seen clips before but we went to watch premier league football game but they had the aussie rules game on a huge screen and the bar was full of these aussie guys it was a big game some team trying to get into the playoffs or something i've never watched a whole game before it's a fucking crazy game do you, do you watch it not really, but I have in the past, obviously. And it's one of those games <laughs> that takes incredible fitness, right? You're talking about AFL here, yeah. right? Like, it takes yeah. ma- you've got to be so fit for that. It is incredibly grueling. Like, they do so much running. And you can see, and like, it's quite, um, like, if you watch the way they tackle each other and like, take a, catch a mark and stuff, it's just, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like when we're playing football or rugby in the playground as kids because there's just so many on each team and everyone's just kind of fighting and going for it. But yeah, I kind of liked it. Anyway, before we close out, tell people where to find you, tell them what's coming up, tell them how to find your show. I'll obviously share it out. I mean, I share it out anyway, but just tell people how to find you. For sure, yeah. So look, uh, my Twitter is at Stefan Levera. My website is StefanLevera.com. You can find the podcast on iTunes and Spotify and YouTube and all that if you search Stefan Levera Podcast. And yeah, in terms of what I've got coming up, so I'm working on this hardware wallet interview series right now. I've got uh, some ideas for uh, another series I'm working on for next month. And uh, yeah, uh, I would say, yeah, it's basically have a listen if you're interested to learn a bit more about basically Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Well, I hope you do a series on Austrian economics as well, because that one I would definitely check out. But thanks for coming on. We did uh, an hour and 45. We probably could have done double that. I could talk to you for hours. Uh, It's been great getting to know you. I consider you a friend now. It was great to meet you out in the States. And I look forward to seeing you in Riga. And look, thank you for all the support you've given me and everything I do.
Well, look, thank you very much as well. It's uh, great to, it was great to meet you. And uh, look, uh, thank you for inviting me on the show. <laughs> no worries, man. Look, take care. Okay, so what did you make of that? Did you enjoy that? How great is Stefan? Like I said, have you checked out his podcast? Have you subscribed? If you haven't, you're missing out. It's a very different show for mine. It's a lot more expert, goes into a lot more detail. Also, whereas I'm just a person who asks questions, Stefan is an educator. He's actually, his favorite show of mine was the one he did where he just spoke in the mic, teaching about Austrian economics, which was super cool. And for me, it was a great insight into Austrian economics and learning more about libertarianism. And I think Stefan did a great job in answering my questions, clearing up some of the confusion I had. I've got to say, though, even though it all makes perfect sense to me, all the ideas around free markets and a smaller state, I still struggle to picture a world without a state. I also struggle to see how a country can operate without a social layer. And I know that makes me a statist and I know socialism is evil, etc., etc. But I don't know. I still struggle to fully reject that. Maybe it's a journey. Maybe it takes some time. I don't think these things are an instant transition. I don't think you wake up one day, hear about libertarianism, and suddenly think all socialist policies should be rid, and then we should immediately dump the government and have no state. I'm not sure even the migration to such a situation would be healthy, but perhaps it's a slower process. Perhaps it's a migration to less government. Uh, the adoption of free markets, removing regulation, and perhaps Bitcoin is the tool to help make this happen. But what do you think? Was this helpful? Are you an Austrian economist? Are you a libertarian? Do you believe we should instantly get rid of the government? Or do you, what do you think? It'd be great to hear from you. I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Also, a massive thanks to Stefan for coming on the show. And seriously, if you haven't checked out his show, what are you doing? Make sure you get onto iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. It is an amazing show. I love it. It's where I go to learn more about this. But also, actually, I mentioned this show, The Tom Woods Show. That's another great show for learning about libertarianism. Anyway, as ever, you got any questions, you can reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindig.com. And if you want to support the show, I do want to say a massive thanks to everyone who does. I ask this every week, and I know it's annoying for regular listeners, but everything you do to support the show enables me to do this. Whether you leave me a review on iTunes or you just listen to the sponsors, it's all really helpful in keeping this going. But if you do want to help, there is a section on my website. It's whatbitcoindid.com. Go to the support section. So much on there. Like I say, listen to the sponsors. If you don't want to listen to the sponsors, you become a patron. It's $5 a month. Head over to patreon.com forward slash whatbitcoindid. You can buy some merch. If you want to be a sponsor, get in touch. I've got some openings up for next year. You can leave me a review on iTunes. You can click on the subscribe button. You can follow me on social media. You can also check out my website. That's whatbitcoindid.com. Loads of stuff on there. You can sign up to my newsletter. And you can share this out with your friends and family. And you can do all of that. Please do. Please. It helps the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, as I said in the intro, you might have skipped that, but I've got some events coming up. I'm going to be at Russell O'Kun's Bitcoin Is event in LA on September the 1st. I'm also going to be emceeing the Baltic Honey Badger in Riga on September the 14th and 15th. I'm then going to be heading out to Wyoming for Caitlin Long's Wyo Hackathon from the 19th to the 22nd of September. I am then also going to be in Palm Springs for Crypto Springs, which is September the 23rd to the 25th. If you're at any of those events, you want to hang out, you want to grab a beer, then just give me a shout. We'd love to meet you. Anyway, hope you have a great weekend. Hit me up if you've got any questions. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Mm-hmm.